It is um, my incredible privilege to introduce Andrea Mondragon Rodriguez. I met Andrea five years ago in a complete and total chance encounter in an elevator going to a Chicago Public Schools student government meeting where she was representing Juarez High School. Uh, I fell in love, and ever since then, every single day, she has awed and inspired me constantly, and I know she will do for you as well. Let me introduce Andrea Mondragon Rodriguez. Good evening. I am Andrea Mondragon Rodriguez, a junior at Denison University. I was brought to this country from Mexico City at 20 months old. I was raised by a wonderful mother who was willing to risk losing everything that was familiar to her and provided her with stability so that I could have better opportunities in life. She spoke little to no English, and as a single mother in a foreign land, things were hard. Our early years in Chicago were spent moving around a lot, and with my mom working late night factory shifts to make ends meet, she wasn't home a lot, so I had many caretakers, which left me feeling like I didn't have a home or a community to call my own. That is until we moved to Pilsen, which is in the heart of urban Chicago, when I was 14. I started to have hope for the first time because I found a community that made me believe like I was finally home. I am proud to call Pilsen home because of its rich Latino culture and inspiring people that make you believe and strive to do your very best. As a DACA dreamer, mapping out my future has not been an easy task. My mother instilled in me that getting a good education was key to having a successful life. I graduated from Benito Juarez Community Academy, where I was involved in extracurricular activities and academic clubs while maintaining a 4.0 GPA. I always wanted to pursue higher education, but getting there was not as easy as I thought it would be. I was accepted into a number of colleges, but as a DACA dreamer, financial aid was extremely limited and in many cases was not an option. My dream was, at was to attend Denison University and I had all but written off all the possibilities of going there due to cost. However, little did I know my American dream was about to come true. A group of generous Chicagoans funded a full ride scholarship for all four years to Denison. I couldn't... I couldn't believe it then, and some days I still don't believe it. But I am thriving, and it's real, and it continues to challenge me in ways that I didn't know were possible. I keep rising to the occasion. As a freshman at Denison, I had not yet found my voice and was unsure of where my path and place would be. One of my first projects was to have Denison declared a sanctuary school. I met with Dr. Adam Weinberg, president of Denison, to discuss this. During the meeting, I discovered I was the first and only DACA student ever enrolled at Denison. <laughs> After a meeting, a support team made up of board member, Senator Richard Luger, Vice President Dr. Dr. Kennedy, Dr. Hinton, my first year advisor, and Dr. Sears, my academic advisor, was, was created to assist me in any future needs regarding my DACA status. This energized me to continue the fight and rights for all dreamers. My next endeavor was to unite a group of all, uh, my next endeavor was to unite groups of all diversity on campus by extending an invitation to have them join me in a peaceful demonstration for immigration rights. I was pleasantly surprised by the support given by so many students. We met at the campus fag pole and locked hands in a circle as a demonstration to our unity. I was encouraged and proud of my fellow classmates. Later that day, I organized two vans load of students to join Ohio State University in a DACA rally. 
I also collaborated with La Fuerza Latina, the African Student Association, Outlook, and the Black Student Union to join in, da in tabling for DACA. The goal was to encourage students to write a letter to state officials to keep DACA. We met every Thursday during common hours, which allowed for, student, for additional student and faculty activism. We sent 300 letters in two months. Through my, through my involvement with Amnesty International, I was invited to a human rights conference in Washington, DC, where we were given the opportunity to meet, to meet with several members of Congress. We were also provided with many tools and skills to take back to our campus in order to continue on our mission toward a more humane society. I am so grateful to all the communities of people that have believed in my potential and have supported me along my journey. I wouldn't be here today without the encouragement of my mom, mentors, friends, faculty, and my mentees. As I continue on my path to higher learning, I will always remember where I came from and all the sacrifices that have been made on my behalf. I am humbled by the generosity and ongoing support. I will continue to strive for excellence in everything that I do. I have found my voice, and it continues to grow and get louder each day as I recognize the important, uh, the important part I will play in the bigger picture. I will continue to be an advocate for myself and others as long as there is injustice happening. As Dylan Thomas said, do not go gently into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. I am a dreamer that still believes in the dream. Thank you. What an amazing standing ovation. I haven't even said anything yet. <laughs> I'm Christopher Yanov, the founder and president of Reality Changers, and I knew I had a tough act to follow. So here's my story. Actually, there's three. In the heart of central Mexico, there's an intersection that has existed for decades. This intersection where two dirt roads come together their names, Calle Loma de la Esperanza and Calle Ilusión. We've arrived at the intersection of illusion and hope. Near this intersection lives Nazario, where he rides his little motorbike 30 minutes on a dirt road, each way to school and back, with his little sister clutching on to her backpack for dear life as they make education a top priority in their lives. They don't have much else. In fact, a couple summers ago, Nasario just had one shirt, one pair of pants, and the same shoes that he wore every single day to school. Nearby, in this state of Guanajuato, lives his friend Christian. And Christian's father has worked at the same shoe factory that Guanajuato is famous for, for over 30 years until his body could no longer work. So they brought the shoe materials to his home where he sits for 12 to 16 hours every day putting together the shoes that may be on your feet right now. Well, as we get closer to this intersection of illusion and hope, one must make a decision. And Nasario and Christian decided to further their education. And so through a partnership with Reality Changers and Central Fox, we were able to send dozens of students to UC San Diego for the last two years. They spent three weeks living on campus, living in college dorms, and actually earning college credit before they finished high school in Mexico. In 2001, I started Reality Changers with just $300 after working with gang members for five years and having no results decided to stop talking about drugs or gangs and all the negatives out there. That's like telling a kid on a tightrope, hey, don't look down. Instead, we decided to help them focus on accomplishing their goals on the other side of that tightrope and become a first-generation college student. Now, 17 years later, that $300 of seed money has turned into over $100 million in scholarships for low-income youth here in San Diego.
For the past two summers, 100 Reality Changers students who live in San Diego have hosted the couple dozen students from Guanajuato when they have this college residential experience every July. But now, there's still one more entity coming to this intersection of illusion and hope. The ASU GSV Summit started in 2010. This is the ninth edition. And little did the summit know that one day it would come to this intersection and cross paths with Reality Changers and Central Fox. They heard about this program. They wanted to make it better. And so now, thanks to a $50,000 donation by the ASU GSV Summit, Reality Changers will send its students from the United States to Central Fox this summer to experience the world's first foreign exchange program at a presidential library. And not only that, it's exclusively for low-income students. At the end of our talk, we'll share with you how you can continue to support this amazing program, this cross-border experience, and no longer just talk words, but actually take action. But first, we have somebody really important to introduce. Are you ready? Yes. Are you, you say born ready if you're ready, so I know for sure. Are you ready for the most exciting speaker of tonight? Yes. Did I hear born ready? All right, great. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the person who made this partnership between Central Fox, Reality Changers, and the ASU GSV Summit possible, the 55th President of Mexico, Vicente Fox. So he left, and now what? <laughs> what are we going to do? Thank you for having invited me here. They asked me, Arriba Guanajuato. Arriba Guanajuato. They asked me to share some uh, thoughts and ideas with you on this constructive uh, dialogue. And let me maybe take the example of Andrea. Ven pa' acá, chiquita. <laughs> Marta is around, but he's back there. Uh, take the example of Andrea, because in her life time, her life span, same like it happened to her, the whole world has changed significantly. And maybe I should say right from the beginning that there is only one way you can change a nation in one generation, and it's through education. And this is what happened to her today, half Mexican, on her blood, half American, on her roots and her feeling and her culture that he has been nourished with here. The same is my case. I'm half Mexican, I'm half American. Because my grandfather was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. And back in 1895, he came down to Mexico as a migrant without a penny in his pocket, looking for his American dream. And he found that dream down in the state of Guanajuato at Rancho San Cristobal. And we've been there for five generations. So he accomplished his American dream. The dream of all Americans that we live in this continent, and the dream that will never die, the dream of freedom, of opportunities, cannot fade away on the night. It must stay alive, because it's, 
is an aspiration of all of us. We have very iconic dates. For instance, many people claim that 2008 was a turnover in the world. It was a change of paradigm. Many, many things happened that year that brought us the powerful capacity of technology, brought us the internet, brought us the Facebooks, brought us later the Ubers. And this world has accomplished things that we had never dreamed about. We have expanded our lives by more than 12 years that we have today as a gift of reason, science, humanism, the enlightenment. We all have a much better quality of life. We all have much more opportunities to be in a school and to have health. We all in the world, including Africa, Latin America, have progressed significantly, incredibly. Throughout the lifespan of Andrea is the lifespan of NAFTA, for instance, that we created that powerful tool that has increased the competitiveness of this block of three nations that we call North America. But then lately today, and they claim it was 2016, big, profound changes are happening. Nationalism, isolationism, breaking blocks of nations, the Brexit, the disruption of a president here in the United States, which is strongly nationalistic, even authoritarian, the building of walls, the change in economic concepts that create wealth, like trading, like exchange of products and services. And so we are now into a new dilemma among two worlds. One is keep what we're going and we've been doing for years and years, globalization, openness, exchange, or go back to the old days of nationalism and isolation. It's, it's a difficult dilemma, but the choice is clear. We must rely on what we have built throughout these years. And this is when I come back to education. Latin America finally became free, got rid of all dictators, populists, and demagogues, in just a couple of decades, and Latin America has been back to a very dynamic growth. Over 5 to 8 percent average growth for the whole of Latin America, which is 500 million people. And Mexico did the same. Mexico today is at full employment. It's increased its coverage on education and health to reach 100% of population. Yes, we do have a healthcare system that encompasses 100% of Mexican families, which other nations don't have. But all of this is through a strong effort, sacrifice, working hard to attain that capacities and skills that we have today. NAFTA has been significantly a success on its main purposes. One is let's make North America the leading region of the world and the most competitive region. And this happened because remember not 
far long away uh, before General Motors, Chrysler Corporation, Ford Motor Company went broke. And taxpayers had to rescue them with billions and billions of US dollars. And these companies survived and they came back to the marketplace because they became NAFTA corporations. Because now they work in Canada, United States, and Mexico. So they regained competitiveness. Not every single nation can be competitive in all fronts of development. So there is capacities and skills that each nation has. Number two objective was to level off income and opportunities in our three nations. And briefly, I can tell you that when NAFTA started, the gap on income between Mexico and United States was tenfold. You would make one dollar on the Mexican side, and by crossing the river, learning how to swim, or jumping walls, you will make $10. Who of you would not go for that powerful incentive of increasing your income tenfold? So it's an economic issue what we have on the border. But what happened 25 years after one generation, the lifespan of Andrea, is that gap reduced to half of what it was. So now the difference is five to one. And this is why you see the reverse trend of Mexicans going back to Mexico and reducing those that are coming to the United States. Why this happened? Because of education, because of productivity, because of competitiveness that we have learned and that we do have today. And this is the miracle of NAFTA that we must continue. And this is what, when, what we can extend to the rest of the world, to progress together like we have done lately. Now, my beliefs in education and what we are trying to do in Mexico is number one, let's keep it open. Education should not have borders, should not have limits. And this is why This is why we came with this exchange between San Diego University, uh, the great organization and team that Chris has got of reality changers, and Centro Fox, the first presidential library in, outside of the United States. And in this library, the main subject and the main issue that we deal with is again education. Education for leadership. So we bring in 50,000 kids every year to Central Fox. There's one message that we give them. You were not born to be poor. You were not born to be a migrant. You were not born to join the cartels. You were born to be president. You were born to do great things in your life. And this is what we must do everywhere, to work on that. And what better example than this nation that has led the world in the last decades, this leading nation that has shown the way to go to the rest of the world. When you elect a president here in the United States, you're electing the leader of the world. That's why we participate so much. That's why we have a strong interest of what is going and happening here. I cannot imagine this nation renouncing to its leadership in the world. Because when you leave an empty space on leadership, somebody will come and fill it up. And that's already happening. Other nations are really uh, moving rapidly ahead in trying to assume that leadership. This nation that I love so much must stay leading the world. But there is only one transcendent kind of leadership, which is compassive leadership. That's the only one that transcends. <laughs> the 
that's the only one that brings joy and happiness to those leaders that are on the arena building this great world that we will see on this 21st century. That kind of leaders is the ones we must have all around the world. And hopefully, and it is happening in Latin America, it is happening in Africa, it is happening everywhere because this nation has shown the way. So this nation cannot withdraw, cannot isolate, cannot build walls, because there is too many human beings that are going to be suffering because of that. So thank you all for being involved in education. I am absolutely sure that you must be extremely happy with yourselves because you, what you are doing, what you're doing is, is molding human beings through education. And that's the great thing about a teacher or about somebody that works on education. You're molding characters, you're molding personalities, you're molding people around what you do. And that's almost close to what God could do. It's, to me, the best aspiration of a human being would be being for others, doing for others, molding others, so you are transmitting your personality, your capacities, your skills, your heart, your soul to all those other human beings. So I love you guys. Keep going. Chris is back. We're fortunate enough to be able to ask some questions with the president here tonight. Mr. President, you started off as a truck driver for Coca-Cola. You then became president of Coca-Cola Mexico. And then you became president of Mexico. <laughs> what did you learn at Coca-Cola that helped prepare you for the presidency? Let me tell you what I learned as president. And this might be a good experience for the guy which is president here. <laughs> it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing to run a corporation than running a government or a nation. Takes you, it takes you a lot of time to learn the difference and to adapt to your new challenge. I went through being congressman first, and from there I became governor of my state, and finally president of Mexico. Even when I became president, the first two years, I was still adapting. You don't go through executive orders. You don't fire who doesn't work. In politics, it's a totally different issue. And this is what I learned, the difference from being CEO of Coca-Cola to being president of Mexico. Let's uh, talk about Central Fox, the presidential library the, that you built. It's a beautiful place. I go at least once a year. And a former speaker here at this conference, Bill Gates, has said that people often overestimate what they can do in one year, but they often underestimate what they can accomplish in 10 years. What do you hope to see with Central Fox in one year and in 10 years? Great thought, great thought from uh, Bill Gates. Matt and I are very thankful to him because in our administration, he donated 30 million to Mexico to build libraries in Mexico. Great thinking. And, uh, and uh, uh, what we uh, know about this library in 10 years, 
is that there is no limit to what you can do. For instance, we started with a few visitors a year. Today, we have overpassed 200,000 visitors. Uh, today, that program of President for the Day, we started with maybe 1,000, 1,500 kids that we brought to Central Fox. Today, is those 50,000 that we bring every year. Uh, at that time, we had one foundation. Today, we have three. One of them attends uh, people with severe brain damage. Uh, we attend 240 of them, and now we're building and expanding to attend uh, uh, over 500 of them. So it's, it's no limit when you are really committed with a cause and when you, are, you have discovered your leadership within, and then you know how powerful you are in accomplishing things. This is what we've done there, and uh, we yet, I'm 75. I know for this 21st century, all of us will have a lifespan on the average of 130 years. Just imagine, <laughs> it's going to be boring. <laughs> but we're going to have a chance to do much more than what we can do in 75 or 80 years that we have today. And this is real, and it will happen in this world. Central Fox is just a few minutes away from that intersection of illusion and hope. Uh, now let's look more broadly uh, at all of Latin America. What do countries like Brazil and Mexico need to do to build and attract talent so they become economic powerhouses? Okay, those are the two largest economies in Latin America and the two largest populated countries in Latin America. But the main problem yet in Latin America is twofold. We have fallen down into a series of uh, increasing violence that is going beyond acceptable limits. And this is done and caused by drugs. And drugs that are consumed in this nation, and that Bolivia, Ecuador, Venezuela, and others produce. And they come through Mexico. And that's why we have this war on drugs in Mexico. That's a significant obstacle to our development. And number two would be corruption. Corruption is another tumor another cancer that we have in Mexico, we have throughout Latin America, and that we must extirpate these two problems, corruption and violence. My answer to violence and drugs is legalizing. Legalizing will take away so much money from cartels. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and also will bring in uh, to save many, many lives, because in Mexico we lose 80,000 kids like Andrea and like the kids you saw here every year are killed on the streets of Mexico. And it's because of drugs and drug cartels. I think legalizing will come to solve that problem in Mexico. Along those same lines, most of the people here in this audience um, are in charge of a lot of people. Um, could be dozens, hundreds, even thousands. Uh, you as a president of a country with over 100 million people, what kept you up late at night uh, with all the things that you had to worry about? No, let, let, let me tell you, uh, in life, with age, you get some wisdom. And uh, when I became president, I, had, I was old enough to learn that it's much better to manage, administrate, conform a organization, effective organization, by the way I elected all the cabinet members through headhunters. So I didn't know any one of them in advance. I didn't care about what party they belonged to and I didn't care about whether they were women or men. So gender equity, that's the way the cabinet was selected, finding the best for each position. I think that's very, very important. I think ideologies, 
I think ideologies are a case of the past. I think this partisan division that you see here, that you are born Republican and you die Republican, you're born Democrat and you die Democrat, and you never change those dogmas that political parties impose to people. I love much more to keep my freedom to elect the men or the women that could be the best president or presidenta for my country and not necessarily for my own party. Because what's going on here is the same thing around the world. This is not working. It's a permanent conflict of ideologies on instead of working pragmatically to come up with solutions for people. And I think that is the most important thing. I'm sure Obama could have done much better as president if he didn't have all those negative conflicts with the other side. And same thing I would say today. I don't like Trump, I don't have to say it. <laughs> and I don't like his stupid war. But yet, but yet, if we work together, we accomplish much more than this divide that we're having almost everywhere in the world, not here, everywhere in the world, same thing. I'm sure a new way of democracy, freedom, conforming governments will soon be born because what we have today has not delivered and people is getting very tired of not seeing what they expect out of a government. So our last few moments here, I'd like to end with a segment called Final Words of Advice with President Vicente Fox. <laughs> you, you mentioned uh, wisdom in your last answer, and a lot of people look to you for wisdom. So if you could have some final words of advice for Joe, who wants to go to Central Fox, what would your advice be? No, uh, you really fast. I don't think I can give advice to nobody, really. I'm, I'm, I'm not prepared for that. But, uh, but one I would think of. We must keep linked the vanguard, the successful vanguard, those who have the opportunities, the education, the money, the success, linked to the rear guard. Because if that link, that distance extends further, we're going to face problems. There are not going to be walls enough to hold that poor people that is running away from violence, is running away from hunger, is running away from problems. It's this world, like Dalai Lama said, belongs to humanity, not to one nation. It's our home, the home of eight billion people. And then he said, and nations belong to their people, to their citizens, not to the president, not to the prime minister. And look at Venezuela. These guys, Chavez and Maduro, come in and take property of the nation. And they decide on their own the fate of that nation. And they decide what's good for citizens and what's not good for citizens. They intervene in our conscience and they impose behaviors. So. That's last century's happenings because, I mean, even churches, dogmas, do not have the right to impose people one belief or the other. That's why I end up with this enlightenment criteria. It's reason. We must reason and sustain our reasoning for everything. No dogmas, no tribes, no ideologies. Number two is science, science that has come with the answers to most of the problems of this world. And finally, humanism. We must be humane, we must be compassionate, we must love our neighbor, and we must love our wife, like I love Marta. And the people want it. Final words of advice for Donald Trump. Go back to business. I mean, I mean, let this nation, 
let this nation keep being progressive, keep being free, keep innovating. It's nobody, nobody has the capacity or should have the right to impose behaviors, to impose his own thinking without even contemplating a team to discuss those ideas with. So I, I think it's indispensable that we domesticate the beast. As we close, I just want to share one final story to, to have some good laughs, but also show the, the, how serious the moment is. Uh, earlier this week, I heard the message from one of Reality Changers' former donors and heard about this partnership that we put together and said, if you forgive me, you saw the, the response you got from this audience, but this particular donor said that he thinks that uh, Vicente Fox should stay in his country and Reality Changers should stay in its own country. So that's a donation of $50,000 we're not going to get anymore. And they can keep it, I guess, at that point. So tonight, uh, after dinner and after our great final speaker to, to close out, uh, you'll be able to go out through these doors. And you'll have a choice to choose the road of illusion and to continue down that path or to choose the road of hope. I hope that you'll continue to support Reality Changers and this special partnership we have with Central Fox and the Summit and support Reality Changers and support hope. Thank you very much. One more big round of applause for Vicente, Mr. President Fox.